thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I believe I would uh, give one of the more uh, theoretical talk, I don't know, uh, in, the, in, the, in this uh, conference. Uh, I'm not directly confronting data with GR and stuff like that, uh, but rather I would tell you about a line of work that I pushed uh, for many years now um, that essentially treats the real world case of spinning objects and basically through the treatment of spinning objects uh, provides input to test GR. Um, so we all know uh, what's, what's, uh, what's happening. We have a plane three acts. Uh, we have the uh, gravitational wave sources, PN sources, which are characterized by um, um, three uh, phases of their evolution. Uh, the spiral phase, where they move in non-relativistic velocity, the merger and the ring down. And each of these different phases is treated with a completely different type of physics. And therefore, the challenge is, uh, is uh, I don't know, quadruple. It's a quadruple challenge because we have to be very good in each one of the, of the, the theories that make up each one of the, sig the signals. But then on top of that, we have to be smart enough in order to stitch the the three input that come from these three theoretical frameworks together in, a, in, a, in, the, in the best and nicest way that makes sense. Uh, so definitely a, a big challenge uh, to model such a, a signal that is here very simplified, of course, it's, it's much richer than that. Um, and as I noted, it's treated by these uh, three different uh, frameworks that cover if we, we can plot on a, a phase space the mass ratio versus the compactness of the system. And we can see that post-Newtonian theory covers essentially everything apart from going into strong gravity. And then numerical relativity covers this corner that we cannot, in principle, approach post-Newtonian theory. And we have, in fact, this plot is also a bit simplified. There is a little over, uh, overlap between post-Newtonian theory. There is clearly an overlap between post-Newtonian theory and self force theory. Um, and then the, like, the very brilliant idea that really was the foundation to putting these three elementary methodologies together into, uh, into one, uh, one uh, continuous uh, theoretical signal was the idea of the effective one body of Alessandro Bonanno and Thibault de Moore, um, which used the very simple idea that we all know from classical mechanics of mapping the two body problem to a one body problem and essentially the idea was let's extend this from Newtonian physics into post-Newtonian theory, order by order. Uh, and the, 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 um, the genius of this idea was that um, it was, it was uh, put forward at the time that numerical relativity could not model the, the intermediate piece of the signal. Um, and so the idea was to connect through this mapping of the two body where the problem in fact starts as a two body and we end with one emergent object to a map between the two parts of the signal, the beginning and the end where we have analytic control of uh, the theory and therefore they were able to provide the most primitive uh, theoretical predictions of the waveform. So that's a, uh, and, and, and to date, um, I would say that the effective one body is the foundation of all gravitational uh, waveforms, although along the years there have been uh, several uh, um, attempts or uh, th there were several years where uh, various groups were trying to develop uh, strictly phenomenological uh, waveforms that don't incorporate in them elements of EOB, but as far as I know, every uh, after two or three years that these type of templates were uh, were were uh, tried out, uh, essentially they came to the conclusion that they can be improved by incorporating EOB, and then EOB again found its way into all the templates again. So, um, as far as I can tell, this is really a foundational ingredient in the current in all of the current uh, waveforms that are used. And since the signal is weak, we have to uh, really be good at the theory that we provide. Uh, in particular, in, in post-Newtonian theory, as you, sh as you saw, uh, accounts for the spiral phase, which is the longest piece of the signal. So we really have to, uh, to do it very well. Um, and so there is a high demand on the accurate theoretical uh, predictions that we provide. <coughs> and 
obviously there is the practical uh, motivation because there is an increasing influx of real world gravitational wave data and P and gravity is key uh, for theoretical gravitational wave data. And um, once we kind of make these observations, uh, I want to uh, convince you or to put forward the suggestion that it, re it really is a good idea to use uh, the framework of effective field theories to handle post-Newtonian gravity uh, because that's effective field theory is in general a framework that is tailored to handle perturbative theories in general and not only in elementary particle physics and PN theory is a perturbative theory in some parameter which is the non-relativistic air velocity <coughs> and uh, furthermore this problem is rich in this in the hierarchy of scales that appear in it and we will see uh, how so in, in one slide or so and so it really gives us a very, very methodologic, very um, systematic framework to, uh, to treat the PN theory. Um, but I am personally very keen uh, when I approach, I mean, beyond the fact that I'm obviously motivated by uh, being able to provide the uh, real world predictions, I am keen to kind of uncover more about the mystery of gravity through these studies. So uh, what these studies uh, also tell us, a fact that we cannot account for yet, is that um, mysteriously PN theory also gives us information sometimes about strong gravity where we don't expect it uh, to give us information about strong gravity. I want to highlight that uh, PN theory, is, uh, the PN approximation means two assumptions. One, that we are in a weak field approximation, and the second is that uh, we have a non-relativistic velocity. So you can choose to relax any one of these assumptions, but in principle, uh, these are the assumptions that we are uh, uh, expanding in, and still we get results that hold even uh, without the assumption of weak, weak field, as if we didn't make the assumption of weak field, weak field gravity. So that's one thing that is interesting. But then the other thing which is interesting is that all along the way, in various ways, we find analogies between things that we see in quantum field theories for strictly particle physics, for elementary particle physics and gravity. And one of these things that really uh, draws my curiosity in recent years, and actually I won't be so much talking about this direction today, uh, is uh, whether we can get insight on and from uh, the graviton Compton amplitude, which is essentially uh, uh, the amplitude of scattering of four particles, which are two gravitons and two massive, uh, par two massive spinning uh, particles, two massive particles with spin. And so um, it's a long-standing question, like can we define uh, such an amplitude for a particle of a, a quantum spin larger than two? And that's just because we don't really know how to theorize a particle. We don't know if at all there exists in nature a particle of spin larger than two. Um, and so that's a very fundamental question um, that is, uh, we, we are able to relate it to classical results in PN gravity. So to me, that's also something that is very um, much motivating me to push forward uh, on my formulation and on my computations. So just to bring you kind of uh, to, to date with the state of the art, again, I'm not claiming that this is uh, all of the state of the art. This is really just a piece of the state of the art in PN theory, the piece that, uh, that uh, handles only the conservative dynamics um, and only really for the simplified case where we, where we just uh, consider a compact objects uh, with spin. So I kind of make this table to kind of really bring you just directly into the present time. Um, so basically N is the parameter where I, with which I parameterize the nonlinearity of the computation. So if it's a leading order uh, correction or next to leading order correction, and that would tell us what is the degree of nonlinearity that we will encounter. So it means that this will tell us what would be the highest end loop graphs that we will have in, in, in a Feynman uh, graph uh, description. But also in if, if you're talking about traditional GR methods, it will just tell us what are the highest uh, multi-integrals that we will have in the computation. So we have this parameter N and we have this parameter L, which is the uh, highest uh, multiple, spinning those multiple that we have to include in the sector in order to get the complete sector. 
So I'm parameterizing my table like that with N and L and an NL entry enters at an N plus L plus parity of L over two PN order. So that's, that means that in order to get some PN accuracy, we'll have to progress across diagonals along this table. And there is also, I also uh, want to highlight to you that there is a gray area which becomes more challenging in terms of this quantum uh, gravitational quantum uh, scattering that I was mentioning. And that is when I really have the first nonlinearity and therefore I have to uh, include a four, par four particle scattering, right? Three is not enough uh, anymore. So it has to be a four particle scattering. So that means that I have to go beyond leading order. So it will include this part of the table. And also if I'm talking about higher spins, it means that I'm uh, starting to talk about spins which are with the uh, quantum spin three uh, spin larger than three over two. Um, and we have this analogy that the classical uh, multiple spin to the power of L corresponds to quantum uh, spin L over two. So in order to, uh, to address, for example, this spin, we have to uh, start tackling spins which are uh, sectors with spin that are uh, with the orders of a cubic in spin and higher. Um, so the, the notation here also shows you what are of which of the sectors here is currently fully done and verified and and which one is only partially uh, tackled or just uh, tackled but only by one group and these computations are obviously very complicated so we really only feel confident when we have more than one group that uses independent methods uh, to verify this um, these computations and what I want to uh, leave you with is that um, in general it's much easier to progress across the boundaries of this table rather to actually, um, you know, as I told you uh, with this, uh, uh, with this uh, formula, in order to really uh, get a, a precision, a certain precision in PN, we really have to cover diagonals, but it is much easier to progress along binaries. So in the case of completely non-spinning case, or in the case that we're only at three level, um, it's much more easier to make progress uh, essentially thanks to the formal uh, progress that was made in my work, doing leading order of spin to infinity is just trivial, becomes trivial once you provide the theory. So this direction is covered. And also this, um, this direction is much more simpler than going into the depths of this table in the diagonal direction, because essentially it involves only compute technical, more technical computational uh, um, difficulty which, the, and this is exactly the thing that we can ask QFT people to help us with because they have been tackling this type of uh, high loop uh, computation for many years. So uh, they are happy to help us with that. Um, it, it's not to say that there are not uh, other uh, effects that enter as we go into these high orders in PN that they have their own complexity that have to be taken into, into account. But if we just uh, consider the the potential themselves, it's in general easier to progress across the boundaries and much harder to kind of go in depth of, the, uh, of this table. And you can see that in fact, currently there, uh, 4PN is completely covered. Um, the, the 4PN frontier is completely covered All the sectors are fully verified except one sector, which is exactly sitting in the middle of this diagonal, the uh, two, two um, uh, sector, which, uh, uh, only uh, my work with Jan Steinhoff uh, covered that fully uh, for the case of generic compact binary dy dynamics. Um, and then now the, I would say the community is uh, engaged uh, very actively already in uh, the 5 p.m. frontier. Uh, and already the point mass was verified by more than one group. And as I told you, I mean, um, in terms of going uh, in three level with spins, it was also covered, but then the things in between are uh, remain to be uh, worked at. So I want uh, to bring this to your attention and I spend a lot of time on this table because I think it's very important to bring you up to date um, and to also tell you that um, the other thing that I want to clarify at this point is that from a very low order, so as of 2 p.m., which is exactly uh, from this entry essentially uh, and onwards, we actually need to know the UV dependence um, in order to complete the PN accuracy. So it's not enough just to compute 
to do the integrals, the loop integrals that we have in the computations, but we actually carry some, if you're doing it in traditional GR methods, you carry some parameters, or if you do it in our method, we call them Wilson coefficients. You carry some parameters that encoding them, this very interesting rich physics that would tell us about gravity in the strong field regime, or if it's a neutron star, it will also tell us about a QCD. Um, so the framework is, I would say, pretty uh, fairly intuitive to uh, understand. In my, in my mind, I, I hope that I will deliver that to you. So the framework of VFTs are, are quite universal. Uh, only one has to identify the hierarchy of scales. And it's very easy to, to realize that we have three distinct scales in this problem, the scale of the single object, the scale of the separation and of the uh, radiation wavelength. And the, it's also very easy from back of the envelope uh, estimates to realize that there is a hierarchy of scales between them. And the small parameter that controls this hierarchy of scales is V over C or V, uh, the, the typical velocity of the, of the uh, moving objects. And the notation that uh, we are using is that an NPN correction is a V to the power of 2N or V over C to the power of 2N correction in classical gravity to Newtonian gravity. And that's exactly where I want to dwell on the fact that in principle, uh, once we identify how to implement this framework on GR, which is what we do, uh, for example, in my line of work, that's what we have done so far, uh, we can start to play with applying this a perturbation, a perturbative scheme to other classical uh, theories of gravity, uh, which are more complicated, obviously, than GR. But in principle, the, the, the PN approximation is finding corrections to Newtonian gravity in classical gravity. So that's exactly um, the point to test uh, if GR is, is, is the complete story. Um, so when we identify that we have three scales, um, it means that in terms of the EFT uh, framework, it means that we uh, proceed in three corresponding stages that, uh, that, re that uh, each at a time try to suppress each of the scales of the problem. So at each uh, stage, we want to, uh, the first stage, for example, we want to zoom out of the compact object. To, the, to some scale that corresponds to, let's say that now we're like at scales which are as large as the separation between the, the two objects. And then at the next stage, we would like to zoom out from the binary and see it as a composite particle that just is endowed with, it is with a set of multiples. And at the last stage, when we will uh, integrate also the scale of radiation, we will be left with an effective theory which contains in it only discrete variables, which would be the multiples dependent in time, that is what we'll be left with in the last uh, final stage. So it's really, a, that's what we call a tower of EFTs, and we build these EFTs one on top of the other. Um, the setup of EFTs, what's nice about it is beyond the fact that, okay, once you realize that you have different scales in your problem, uh, now you can also, you're not like left uh, in the dark, but you actually have a very clear procedure for how to proceed. Um, in order to set up the EFTs. The setup is very universal and also, in my mind, very intuitive. Um, and there are two generic procedures to construct effective field theories, and they are complement complementary to each other. And sometimes we, we can and we, we do use both of them uh, in conjunction, uh, but sometimes it's not possible to use one of them, so we use just, uh, just one. Uh, so the two generic procedure is that either we um, go in a top-down approach, and that in that case, we have the full theory in the, in the small scale, in the smallest scales or in the highest energies, and then we just um, want to have um, a, a more coarse-grained picture. And so we systematically remove extra pixels uh, from, the, from the picture by just using the standard uh, Feynman technology, so by actually a, doing a functional integral over strong field modes that we want to integrate out, modes of the field of high energy or that represent a small scales. And that is what is referred to as the Wilsonian approach from the 70s. In general, all these like uh, th these ideas of effective field theories were uh, born in the 70s. And then uh, the complementary approach is a bottom-up approach. And uh, sometimes we are uh, bound to use it when we have no knowledge of the full theory. And in that case, we just start from scratch. And what we just uh, what we do is just like a photographer that is trying to capture a picture, 
uh, that is unknown, uh, what we do is just we focus on identifying what would be the main degrees of freedom that we try to capture in our photo and what would be the symmetries that they would have to obey. And just from applying these first principles, essentially saying, okay, like if I am uh, um, um, making these degrees of freedom obey the symmetries that I conjecture that uh, my system has, what would be the theory that I'm writing? So these are the principles to uh, build the effective field theories and uh, the very deep theorem that guarantees that if we will do this process to write a theory from scratch and we will actually land on the correct field, the effective field theory as if we did the top-down approach, uh, which we can actually do. We can, in, as I said, in some cases, you can do both of the, these approaches in parallel and confront them. And uh, essentially, the decoupling theorem tells us that by just using this first principle, you are bound to land on the correct effective field theory. Uh, and that's a very deep statement. And the statement is that essentially the physics at different scales actually decouples. Um, so that's the heart of the, the, heart of the matter. Uh, so um, now I will allow myself to be a bit uh, quicker. So um, we proceed then to, to construct a one particle uh, effective field theory. So for example, if we have a black hole, we will, to begin, we will just have like a vacuum gravitational field. Um, but then we would like to integrate out the strong field nodes. And so we will use a bottom-up approach. And so we will, we, we will say uh, what the theory that we will have now, we will, will complement it with additional degrees of freedom. So we will add degrees of freedom in this case a discrete degrees of freedom to designate this uh, single object that we also want to capture in our theory. And the theory that we will write would be uh, the pure gravitational action, but only with the field modes that remain after we integrate out the strong field mode. So this is only the pure gravitational action with the weak field modes. And then we will compensate for the fact that we eliminated uh, the weak field modes from the theory by adding an infinite set of a terms or operators, as they call it in EFT, infinite, infinite set of terms uh, that all, all they have to do is to contain the correct degrees of freedom and then obey the symmetries that we impose the theory to obey. And this picture is actually remains pretty simple when we're just dealing with the point mass case because all we have actually after the pure gravitational piece is the point mass, a point mass term. And this actually serves us very well until 5 p.m. Uh, if we're dealing with a non spinning uh, case. Uh, because that's the first place where we have uh, finite size effects entering in the non-spinning case. Um, then we would proceed to uh, construct the EFT of the composite particle. Once we remove the scale of the single object, we proceed to uh, remove the scale of the binary. Um, and this we do in the complementary way, in the top-down approach, because now we have the full theory, and the full theory is exactly what we obtained in the previous stage. Uh, we write the theory that we obtained in the previous stage, which is the leftover of the pure gravitational action with a copy of the point particle action for each of the objects. And that would be our full theory at this stage. And then we would carry out a path, a, a functional integral um, over the what we uh, identify as at this stage as the stronger field modes. So uh, we at this stage, we um, distinguish between two modes of the field, the orbital field modes and the radiation field modes. And uh, they are distinguished by the fact that the orbital field modes are the, the, the field that mediates the interactions between the objects at the scales of the binary. But then we have the gravitons that are emitted to the observer at LIGO at infinity. Um, and these are physical on shell, so they are different. It's easy to uh, verify that this is strong, uh, a strong field mode compared to the radiation field mode. And then we just, uh, at this stage, we just like really use standard EFT slash QFT uh, techniques to essentially compute what is um, a functional integral via a Feynman diagrammatic expansion. So that's the whole uh, story. Um, so again, the challenge is uh, the challenge kind of to bring this all together. Um, we will start with the full theory that contains the, the gravitational action and- Sorry, uh, can I ask a question? Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, sorry, I'm, I'm not an expert. I just wondering yeah. that actual problem was a classical problem. 
there was no path integral, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so it's a, yeah. So I should say that here uh, we only take into account three, uh, three level uh, diagrams. I mean, three but, level in the gravitons. Yeah, but you have a functional. The whole point of effective field theory is that you are functionally integrating. Uh, you are doing a path integral and getting an effective action, right? Yes. But the actual problem I thought was a classical. It is a classical. Problem. It's just that what we take from this uh, functional integral is only the, the graphs that contribute to the classical piece. So you're right in, in uh, giving this comment. What we, I didn't say, or I wrote it here, that we in the classical context, we only take the three level uh, in gravitons uh, graphs. And you'll see some examples later of the graphs. I see. But the three level okay. graphs can also appear in solving classical equation of motion. I yes, don't have to do have, path integral. They have classical nonlinearities, yeah, but they don't okay. have uh, graviton loops. I mean, uh, uh, classical equation of motion can be solved perturbatively in Feynman diagram approach. Yeah. Where only three level exactly, diagrams yeah. appear. Where three level diagrams appear. Yes. Is it what is being done? That is not path integral. The, uh, yes, but that is the way to write uh, the what we are doing here because we are taking a certain piece from this path integral. I mean, path integral means there will be loops which we but don't know how to calculate. Can, can ah, we, we can come, come back, back later? Yeah, yeah, yeah. because it's a okay. uh, yeah. Um, so, so, but thank you for the co for making uh, this precision. Uh, so, um, as I uh, noted, we uh, we have this um, effective action of uh, the two particle uh, system, and uh, the challenge would be, I would say, the theoretical formal challenge. From experience, I would say that the formal challenge was more to to wisely identify what is the point particle that gives an effective description of the single object. So that was more of the, I would say, the formal challenge in, in the work. And then when you have that, uh, you move to something which is more of a technical challenge, a computational challenge, as I said, uh, when you were trying to, uh, the EFT of the composite particle, then you just uh, use standard things which are uh, very well known in the context of QFT. Um, we just have like some some things which are a bit strange, for example, the kind of propagators we will have will, will not be uh, the usual uh, um, Fourier, uh, the usual uh, integrals that you see over momenta, over four uh, space-time momenta, but rather we will have, for example, integrals over it, it, only over uh, the, the spatial momentum, and then the propagator over time would be a delta function. And why is that? Because we're talking, for example, in conservative dynamics. So it means that interactions in the non-relativity context, they mediate instantly. So we will have some features which are obviously not regular for the context of QFT, but a lot of similarities with QFT. We really can just adapt the tools that we know from QFT and use them here. And so, for example, also when, once we really have to um, uh, aggressively use a, a regularization. We also have to use uh, something which is similar to the MS bar scheme in the in the QFT context, which means that we're just irregularizing our coupling constant of the theory, which in this case is just a, a Newton's a Newton's constant. For, so that's, for example, another thing that we use. So essentially, that's kind of the picture of what we do. Um, I see that I'm already kind of uh, yeah. I'll pick up the pace. Um, so now, so that was kind of the general framework that uh, we are uh, using. And now I want to enter specifically into the advances that were made in terms of uh, the theory with spin, um, which is what I did, a work that I did um, mostly uh, at the time with the Jan Steinhoff, my longtime uh, collaborator, um, and then proceeded with it uh, in, in more recent years with other collaborators. Uh, but essentially, just to kind of give you the, the general framework, so as we said, the, uh, the, the challenge is to, to, to model effectively what is a spinning particle. And in this case, we do it from a bottom-up approach. So we just, the challenge is to identify correctly what are the degrees of freedom in the, in the system and what would be the symmetries that would uh, pertain. And Whereas in the non-spinning case, it's enough to just say, well, the degrees of freedom are just the metric and the uh, position of the of the particle or of, of the of the object. 
Uh, once you're talking about a spinning particle, things get much more complicated. First of all, you have to move to a description that also uses tetrads in, instead of a, just a metric. And on top of that, you have a complication that suddenly uh, the position, what is the position of the object becomes ambiguous because, um, because a spinning object is necessarily an extended object, which means that it has some finite measure. And therefore you have to kind of decide where in this uh, measure, where in this thing that has a measure, you choose the point that designates the position of the, of the object. So there is this ambiguity that comes in and uh, for many years was kind of, kind of just hanging in the air and with a lot of confusion. Um, and related to that, there are also the particle rotating degrees of freedom. And here you really like have to really track very carefully what you're doing. Uh, you're starting from a description with tetrads, and then you switch uh, to uh, to to other uh, to other uh, convenient variables um, along the way. Essentially, uh, essentially at the end you switch to local variables that just describe the rotation in the local frame. So just the Lorentz matrices and the spin, where you're able to disentangle what's happening in the local frame and what's happening in terms of the coupling to gravity. So that's um, in terms of identifying the degrees of freedom. Identifying the symmetries was, it was even more uh, crucial and pl played much more of a key role in the, the fact that we were able to make the, break the breakthroughs that we did. Uh, so again, if we're just in the non-spinning case, all we have to consider is general covariance and word line uh, reparameterization invariance. But, um, but once you consider spin, like really, uh, it, at much lower orders than if, than, uh, if it was the non-spinning case, you really have to immediately think about parity invariance. You have to think about the internal Lorentz invariance that there is in the local frame field. You have to think about the fact that you're dealing essentially, you want to deal essentially with objects which are SO3. And then the thing is to identify that this, uh, if you're using a tetrad, for example, this additional freedom beyond the SO3 invariance that we uh, expect um, to have in the problem, this additional freedom is exactly what corresponds to this freedom that I was addressing before of uh, how to choose the position with, um, within this extended spinning object. Um, we have this additional freedom. So that's uh, the, the, basically, essentially, this, this SO3 invariance and this additional freedom were key and the parity invariance were key um, to the progress that we made. Um, so very smart people did very good works already in the 70s of treating um, a spinning particle essentially uh, under, the, uh, under the influence of an ex external field, which is effectively similar to the idea of effect effective field theory. They didn't call it effective field theory, but essentially it is the same. Um, so th there were these works that were doing, um, that were doing, that were uh, starting to treat the uh, spinning particle and external gravitational field, uh, but but they were they kind of stopped, let's say, halfway in the sense that um, first of all they kind of came up with this formulation that kind that puts forward this, a, a, that kind of mixes puts in a spin which is a canonical variable. So it puts in a spin in something which uh, we want to have to have a Lagrangian. So uh, already when we started the treatment, we had to really justify why we still want to maintain the spin there and what it does for us and also how it, you know, it works with uh, thinking about higher uh, order multiples. So that's uh, one thing that uh, wasn't there before, uh, but also there was a confusion even just when Thinking about spin, uh, there was a confusion about uh, what would be this um, uh, this term uh, that contains the just the basic coupling of spin to gravity, um, and essentially that's the confusion that we solved. And also all the things that come after this basic coupling to gravity. So that means the coupling to gravity that comes with Riemann curvature and covariant derivatives to uh, Riemann curvature, which accounts for finite size effects. All this was not treated. Um, systematically or at all uh, before our work. So essentially this exactly spells out the two the theory challenges that were tackled in our work, uh, spelled out in the work uh, from 2015. Uh, the essence of it is that since a relativistic spin has a minimal finite measure, which, which is S over its mass, 
if it's a Kerr black hole, it would be exactly the ring singularity, the, the size of uh, the, this singularity. Uh, it clashes with the EFT point particle viewpoint, so there is a challenge there uh, for how to uh, resolve them. And we, we, we solve this challenge by introducing gauge freedom in the choice of rotational variables. We identified where is, the, where is this freedom in, in, in our rotational variables. So that was one theory challenge that we tackled. And the other uh, uh, challenge that we tackled was that um, we fixed the non-minimal coupling part of the action, uh, which accounts for the finite size effects. And that's exactly what's related to this, uh, I mean, uh, beyond just uh, giving the accuracy for spinning objects, this really is much more relevant to this particular conference because uh, that's where we have all this additional uh, hidden information about uh, strong gravity. Um, so I will be really sketchy about how we went about to get to these formal advances. Uh, so the first, the first uh, insight in order to uh, resolve this, uh, to kind of understand that we have this additional uh, gauge freedom was just, we just made this very simple exercise. And that was to play with the component, with the temporal component of the tetra that we used to, uh, to uh, capture the rotation of the of the object, and once we did this exercise, where we played, uh, where when, where we played with this uh, component in a in a in a kosher way, in a way that is legit, that is legitimate, uh, we we actually saw that it directly corresponds. This this choice of the temporal component directly corresponds to the formulation of various uh, choices, or what we called in what was called before that in traditional GR SSC supplementary spin conditions in order to gauge uh, the spin variables and the rotational variables. So exactly, the, we saw the direct correspondence and it was like also a generalization because we, we could see how it contained all the various options that people were considering along the, along the years and how they are related. So that was the first breakthrough that we had. Um, and so it led to, to that, that we realized that in general, in fact, the a Lagrangian of the minimal coupling in general, it contains another term uh, beyond the one that is just uh, representing a specific choice of uh, this uh, uh, gauge for the rotational variables. Um, and therefore we want to include in generality this term in the theory. Uh, so that was one breakthrough that we did. The other uh, breakthrough also comes from a very, just like, again, going back to the symmetries and then just working very systematically with the uh, with our assumptions. And as we said, parity invariance was a key to realize that we have to address parity invariance. So the first thing we said to ourselves is we want to have an object that has a definite parity in it. And so we understood that we want to uh, base our formulation on the Pauli, what is the analog, the classical analog of the Pauli-Lubanski pseudo vector, which is defined like that. It has a definite parity. Um, defined like that. Um, it has a definite parity and it, it exactly behaves like an SO3 vector. Um, and then we play, we go about, we do the rigorous checks and analysis and whatever. And, but essentially we go about and we, we see that all the types of combinations that we can have are essentially just direct products of this vector. So uh, we can either have S alpha or S alpha S beta and so on and so forth. Um, so that kind of led us to realize that essentially we're dealing with SO3 entities all the way. Again, we showed that, we anal analyzed that in detail, uh, and then it becomes very evident uh, how to also couple that to the curvature. We just like, uh, again, use definite parity components of the curvature, the electric component and the magnetic component. And then in order to maintain parity invariance, it's very clear how to couple uh, the, the direct products of the spin of the spin vector to the um, uh, to this component of the curvature, and that is the, this very uh, very nice result that we got. Uh, in, we used already in 2014 and 2015 of the infinite set of terms that couple uh, this, all the spin induced uh, multiples to all orders to um, to the curvature. And they are preceded by this Wilson coefficient, what we call Wilson coefficients, or what GR people just so call simply the multiple deformation parameters. Um, starting with these terms, this, uh, this term, for example, was, was addressed already in the 70s, but that's where it stopped. 
Uh, so the quadruple deformation parameter. So starting with this term that already enters at 2 p.m. As I said, finite size with spin already enters at 2 p.m. But then we have the octopole at 3.5 p.m., the hexadecapole at 4 p.m. Um, so essentially we have to take all this in, into account in the current precision frontier. And the nice thing about also about our, our thing that really inspired a lot of progress uh, in the recent years in terms uh, of the um, people that approached it from amplitudes, uh, the amplitudes community is that because we realized that the key thing is that we have this SO3 object vector uh, with a definite parity and the way to construct the theory is to take direct products of this SO3 vector it was directly, it could be directly mapped exactly to um, a formalism that was put forward in the, in the context of amplitudes, which is called massive spinor realicity to treat all types of quantum massive particles with quantum spins, uh, essentially by taking direct products of SU2 spinors. So that, and since SU2 and SO3 are isomorphic, the, it, was, it, it was very uh, kind of straightforward to directly map the two a formulation. So uh, that's a very nice link that we could be seen already from our formulation to elementary uh, particles. Uh, so now uh, it, that would be quicker and that's good because I see that I'm kind of running out of time. Now I'm really progressing to the last uh, part, which is the practical part of kind of showing you how the game works um, because now we constructed the theory of the, of the single particle. And what can we do with it? We want to proceed to compute the uh, effect, the, the two body potentials, the, the, the effective theory of the composite particle. So I just want to kind of uh, remind that all along the way in all of the derivations that were uh, using the EFT formulation, it was very useful to use a Kaluza-Klein reduction, uh, not reduction, because I don't want to confuse it. So Kaluza-Klein uh, parameterization of the metric, which basically just it decomposes different uh, components of the metric into different uh, ingredients. And the nice thing is that the nice idea is very simple. It's just saying, okay, since we're in the non-relativistic uh, approximation, we can think about the time in New Newtonian physics, interactions mediate infinitely fast, right? From this end of the universe to the other. So time can be considered as compact compared to the sp spatial dimensions. And therefore it makes sense to make a parameterization which makes a reduction over the time dimension. So that's the parameterization that uh, have been used all along. And essentially it's just like a way to lay out the field in different ways. We take into account all the field components, but we just like um, the bookkeeping is just a certain smart one. And then we, we end up with a, a scalar component and a vector component and a, um, a, a symmetric uh, three, time, three, time, three by three um, component of the field. And then it's very easy to see that it, it's, there is a certain hierarchy of the coupling of the coupling of these components to the mass, to the spin, and it, it just makes the analysis of all the interactions much easier. And also in terms of computational complexity, it really facilitates the computations. So to show you how it looks, uh, to back to this, uh, I don't know what's the name of the guy who asked me about the past uh, integral. Um, so that's the way that the, um, the graphs uh, that we are dealing with look. And uh, in our graphs, it's not like the usual uh, particle physics uh, a way of drawing graphs in the sense that uh, the time in particle physics graphs flows from left to right. And we insist that, we, to, that the time would flow from, bottom, uh, from the bottom of the, of the picture to the uh, top of the picture. Um, and so what I designate here as my um, vertical lines are the word lines. They are not propagating. They are not propagators. Um, they are not part of the graphs. The graph is only actually the graviton that is in between. So you can see, you will see it also in more complicated graph that if you strip these, um, if you strip these uh, word lines, which are just essentially the frame of this picture, um, you're only left with three level in the graviton. So it's always three level in the gravitons, although it, you see immediately that we have non-linearities, like either the source is non-linear, non-linearly emitting gravitons, or we will have also um, self-gravitational interaction of the uh, gravitational action. So here is the basics, the Newtonian interaction is just a one graviton exchange, and then the 1pn correction that was computed by Einstein already contains a two graviton exchange, 
a correction to the fact that they, for example, to the fact that the propagator is not instant, instant but rather there is some relativistic correction. Then if we consider the basic interactions with spin, we would have things like a spin orbit interaction between a spin dipole and a mass, or we will have an interaction between a spin and another spin or a spin induced quadrupole and an, another mass. For, for example, if we would have to uh, get the interaction up to spin square, we would have to take these two contributions, which are very different in nature. So this is just to give you the basic intuition. And now we come to see what are the results already that our advances uh, gave. Um, yeah, so, so I just uh, wanted to remi uh, remind you that 10 minutes. I have 12 minutes, I see. Ah, 10 to 12 minutes, if you may uh, yeah. finish. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so that's already where we made progress. And as you can see, the graphs are very simple in the progress that we made. And that exactly designates this uh, tree level in spin to all orders. So we're just talking about one graviton exchange uh, diagrams that essentially are uh, uh, interacting between different spin induced multiples of, this, of, uh, of spin. And that would give you the leading order uh, the leading order of spin to all orders. So we demonstrated that to spin to the three and spin to the four, because at the time we just wanted to show that we can complete the four PN, that was the precision frontier at the time. Um, so we completed is the spin to the three and spin to the four. And that, as you can see here, spin to the three is, um, is composed from considering the, the, the spin induced quadrupole with the spin induced dipole and from the spin induced octopole with a mass. So kind of, um, once you kind of realize what is the logic of um, putting these uh, graphs together, it becomes very simple and the computation, the, the, the challenging thing here was to get the pieces of the theory to put on these graphs. But then once you have the pieces for these graphs, the computation itself, as I said, it's one graviton exchange all the way, it's a trivial computation. So the, the loop computational element here, the computational element here was uh, is really not not the not the issue. Um, here, Sorry, uh, really... may Sorry? I interrupt you, uh, Michelle? Uh, yeah. yeah. So I mean, uh, there will be vertices coming uh, from the uh, linearized action that uh, you stated probably at the earlier part of your talk. So these graphs will, are generated from those kind of vertices, these Feynman graphs. Like if you if I expand it around eta mu nu, h mu nu, and then Yes, I mean, yes, yes. I'm just showing you now. Uh, I'm, I will show you little by little different types of uh, results that we have achieved. Okay, okay. So you will see that. So this is just to show you that just with the progress on the theory on, on how to uh, model correctly what is uh, the, the EFT of a, of a single object and not uh, using a lot of fancy schmancy uh, uh, tricks in terms of loop computations, already you can obtain something which is you know, very interesting and meaningful. And that we obtained already in 2014. Um, and then already pretty quickly, we also show that we can do a spin to the squared. So all the contributions up to spin to the squared, which is at the two loop, gets to the two loop level. So next to next to leading, this is what we call next to next to leading order correction. So this was the piece which was hardest to compute. And by the way, to this day, this sector is, as I showed you in the beginning, this is the only sector that is not fully reproduced by any other method to this day. I mean, fully also in terms of like, to also hold for all compact objects, not only for black hole, I mean, really fully, completely. Uh, so that's already one result, which is really longstanding, um, outstanding for, for many years. Um, but now I will approach to really more like the couple of years progress uh, that we had. And that's, I think, coming to the question of the, um, the last curious uh, person who just asked me now is how do we then go about handling in general, more general and uh, um, sophisticated nonlinearities that we encounter. So as you sh have seen already in these basic examples that, uh, that I showed, and we, we basically classify the topologies that enter up to a certain uh, OG, uh, order in, um, in, Newton, in Newton's constant. Um, and then, uh, but the, the point is that once we start to, to get to two loop and beyond, which we want to go to beyond, uh, we essentially identify that we want to have a good handle on how to treat it um, more effectively, more uh, efficiently. 
Um, and so a very basic thing that we that we know, then we can see it either if we just like write the integral and we just make a change of integral so we can see it formally from writing in integrals and switching their form, or this is represented also pictorially here. Um, we can actually say that because, as I told you, we consider the word line as not, not dynamical propagators, we can actually shrink both of them to a point. And what we're uh, left with, what is left from all these uh, graphs are essentially a two point, we're computing two point functions with graphs in them that contain just massless bosons. So we can really do now the mapping directly to QFT computations using all the tools that were known and some of them were developed in uh, the beginning of the 2000s uh, even um, of multi-loops of, uh, of really efficient methods of integration by parts uh, to handle a uh, multi-loop integrals or multi-integrals in general. And all of that we incorporated in a code that I uh, wrote together with Jan Steinhoff uh, of how to implement these effective field theories in uh, post newtonian theory. Uh, so we really got a, a good handle on that. Um, so that was one thing which was useful to map between our graphs, which in, in the world line picture to this kind of QF, more QFT-ish picture. But then on the other hand, we also found um, that it's useful to kind of also maintain our understanding about what are the true nonlinearities uh, that give the, the, the in more interesting and complicated features in the computations. And so we, we also did, I did this analysis a couple of years ago um, essentially, basically kind of identifying what are the, the real uh, three loop uh, graphs from this, uh, from, you know, the whole possible topologies, for example, the, which are uh, possible at, at the end to the three leading order at next to next to next to leading order. Uh, so we did also that and we kind of showed how uh, these specific graphs are related to the interesting features that we see. Um, and also, I kind of want, just want to kind of go back um, when we'll speak about this analogy. I see that I still have six minutes. Uh, I just want to kind of go back and highlight to you that alternatively, now we can think about these word lines that we uh, said that we, we want to treat them as word lines, static word lines. Just, we have just like classical sources that move along the trajectory, and they just like they just for us, they just play the role of moving sources that emit the, the gravitons and that's what we care about. But alternatively, you can say, okay, let's look at it more generally and let's think about it actually as a fermion. A fermion that is a, a massive fermion that is a, actually, it's a propagator of a fermion, what you see here. And then, for example, if you cut, if you, if you cut this uh, picture, for example, here, and you just look at that, you will see exactly two gravitons and two fermions, so this, that, that is a four, what we call a four particle scattering amplitude um, that makes up these graphs. So I want to also, that this is just like a, 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 an indication to you how um, like a more general treatment that uses kind of amplitude's point of view uh, to compute graphs um, will handle these computations, which will actually um, will be more general, but also a bit heavier. Than what we do, what we what we actually use is some simplified picture of this computation because we're interested only in the classical uh, contributions. So to uh, go to a very recent uh, result, very recent nice result that we obtained. So uh, we went beyond this sector, which is still not fully reproduced to date. We computed the full uh, n to the three leading order spin to the squared. And the nice thing there is that it enters at five pn. So similar to the non-spinning case. Uh, where uh, finite size effects enter uh, in the non-spinning uh, case. As I told you, in spinning case, they enter at much lower orders, but what is uh, kind of similar is that we also have a, a new effect that enters, uh, that is quadratic in Riemann, but contains explicitly the spin and is associated with a specific uh, Wilson coefficient that is not uh, linked to the previously known uh, love numbers of of generic non-spinning objects. Uh, we had to compute a lot of diagrams in order to cover all this sector. We have 1,000, more than 1,000 graphs uh, that cover all the terms which are up to linear in Riemann. And then we found out that there is actually another, just one other graph that comes in beyond linear in curvature and contributes to our sector. And that comes with this uh, new uh, spin of number. Of course, it entailed a lot of computational uh, complexity, which we handled you know, using all the 
uh, doing our best to kind of use the body of knowledge from QFT, but then really working hard to adapt it to our uh, case and really, you know, uh, come up with our own codes that, uh, that do it efficiently for our own uh, thing. And that is just showing you the theoretical progress that um, uh, the theoretical extension that was needed in order to obtain this additional graph that eventually we found it contributes. So the point was that we had to extend the non-minimal coupling part of the theory beyond linear in curvature. And then if these are the usual of numbers, these uh, coefficients that you see here, you, that these are linked to the usual of numbers that are being like uh, suggested and studied for many years now. These are the, our new spin of numbers that we have. And we found now that uh, this C is e, e squared, S squared is actually there. It actually is there in the observables. We computed observables, the physical observables, and we see that it's actually staying there, which means that it really represents a physical effect. And so we discovered this new um, spin of number. Um, and I will really gloss over, I see I have basically uh, really gloss over the fact that uh, I also, there is like another line of uh, research that is more obsessed about going to uh, pushing just in higher orders in spin. So for that, we kind of push to at next to leading order spin to the three and S to the fourth. This is not complete. This analysis is not complete yet. And then the goal is to proceed to S to the fifth. Really, I won't uh, dwell on that. Some, on some aspects of it are already spoken. Uh, again, all this work is really like really recent, last couple of years, something like that. Um, and I will just conclude now um, by saying that, um, so, so far, if you want to know more or read more about this whole framework, you're invited to read in uh, my review, which is now uh, became already outdated. I mean, there are these all new works that came after it. You can also look at them. I also try to keep a public web page, which explains things to a more broad uh, audience. So I also refer you to look there, although I have to update it, uh, which I haven't done uh, kind of uh, recently so much. Um, and um, I want to kind of just recap by saying that this framework really proved very clearly that we can obtain real world scalability, providing real practical results. Um, it's a framework which is self-contained, it enables direct derivation of both mathematical quantities and observable quantities of physical quantities. It has uh, its own ways to uh, do its self-consistency checks. It's really, it really enabled to push the precision frontier, which is now we're uh, all uh, engaged with the 5 p.m. order. Uh, we provided a code, uh, which is publicly available. If, if uh, people are interested to, uh, for example, generalize it to other theories of gravity, uh, classical theories of gravity, other than GR, they're invited to do so. And there are actually some people already in the community that they approach that uh, using our code. Um, and the fundamental lessons from what uh, from this in general line of study that I've, I've done so far, uh, to me, is uh, several things. Is First of all, the pain gravity informs us about gravity in general. It informs us about uh, weak uh, field gravity, obviously, but what I'm trying to say is that even just doing PN gravity really helps to, for example, uh, uh, understand what would be the, the PM approximation, which would be just a generaliz generalization to all orders in velocity. But then also we get indication about what happens in strong gravity and even analogies to quantum um, gravity. And uh, also the effective theories have been extended and are being and can be extended to new effects. And these new effects uh, will tell us about candidate theories of gravity. Uh, so we can test various theories of gravity. And I also I, I encourage uh, people interested to extend the treatment of this framework that we put uh, forward to various uh, theories other than GR. Uh, we, I really look forward to get possible insights for and from the graviton Compton amplitude with higher spin. So there is all of this line of work. And finally, I really am, am curious about the question. I'm really motivated by the question is uh, whether QFT advances will enable us to analytically capture, maybe, you know, someday, I don't know, uh, will enable us to analytically capture the strong gravity regime of the gravitational wave signal, which would definitely be more uh, more than awesome. Uh, so I will end with that, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Anishal, for an interesting talk. Yeah. So I'm sure there will be questions. Oi. Yes, Sukanto. Huh, I should go ahead. stop sharing. 
Um, Hi. Yeah, nice talk. Um, Actually, I was wondering if you can go back to the slide where you introduced the spin love number. Yeah. I was interested in um, your thoughts on uh, what part of the you know binary parameter space would be best for it to, to, to search for it observationally. Uh, it's really a new discovery, and actually, uh, um, what part of parameter space? Um, in what sense? I mean, um, in large numbers, large spins. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, obviously large spins, which I kind of know to be hard to mod to model. I mean, even with simulations, right? Um, so yes, in principle, obviously large spins because the large. I mean, the whole assumption that it enters at five pn is that we're dealing with the case of large spin. So otherwise, it would would be pushed for higher orders. So right. obviously, we would like to consider some, you know, like massive care. Um, that is, you know, still still maintained. It's a very high spin. Could right. be a very and theoretical yeah. scenario, but who knows? Uh, Even in yeah. the most favorable uh, situation, uh, yeah. how much, the like, how many, you know, what fraction of the phase does it uh, change for, uh, like, a ten plus ten solar mass binary black hole, or, or can you quantify uh, this? Like, what, how much change does it introduce to the phasing? Uh, I, I, that's, for me, this is, a, I'm sorry, I really don't know how to answer these questions. I mean, in the sense that it should be worked out into an EOB, uh, an EOB treatment and, you know, and then compared against numerical simulation. And that's usually something that comes after we come with the, up with the basic results. And this is really a new result. Um, yeah, so no, I, I totally honestly don't know how to answer the question. No, it, but it's very exciting, which is why it prompted yeah. me to ask. Yeah, but uh, also the thing about this in general, I mean, in general, um, I mean, even before the spin, just like the usual love numbers, I mean, we all know that um, the thing about them is that they can be, I mean, um, these various uh, effects that happen even beyond love numbers, uh, the resonance, they can be numerically very large. I mean, even though you estimate the effect itself, in terms of dimensional analysis, it's 5pn or whatever, when you come close to the merger, uh, you get some crazy tidal effect. And um, and so, you, I mean, and so it's kind of hard to, uh, it's uh, like, it's hard to dismiss uh, what is the importance of these effects until you really kind of gone into it. Exactly. So, so um, last question. Yeah. So the numerical yeah. relativity waveforms would already have this imprint, right? Sorry, the? Numerical relativity waveforms would already yeah. have an imprint of this love number. Um, it should have, yes, because they're doing full theory. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So which means if um, for cases where this can be relatively large, yeah. if the post-Newtonian waveforms do not account for it, we will yeah. introduce systematics when we try to do EOB or phenological stitching yeah. of extended waveforms. Yeah. But I mean, uh, it's this is whole like very fine, minute, you know, precision. I mean, in the sense that this is all part of five pn correction, which is still not implemented into the templates. It, it all the all the corrections with spin uh, at five pn are not implemented to the waveforms yet. It's you know, so it's part of a, a already a fine accuracy that is uh, not uh, tested yet against simulations. It's not only this effect. I mean, the whole correction of 5 p.m. Is, is, is not there yet. So, yeah. It, it usually there is like a lag of time until uh, the phenomenological people usually um, implement uh, my results essentially to, to the waveforms. Thank you. Yeah.